Around seven years ago, I attempted to create an AI that could beat the hardest level of Super Hexagon using only screenshots, meaning it would have no knowledge of the game's code and I couldn't simulate the game or anything like that. Super Hexagon is a very simple but extremely fun and addicting video game where the player controls this little cursor that rotates around the hexagon in the middle and the goal is to avoid all the obstacles coming in from all sides by moving either left or right. If you survive for 60 seconds, you win. That's it. If this looks super confusing to you, don't worry, that's part of the game. It's a visually overwhelming game that forces you to remain focused even when the screen is rotating and pulsating. Obviously a self-playing program needs to be able to handle that as well. When I set out to make this self-playing AI, I had only been coding for about a year, so I was a bit of a noob. I thought if I just threw some computer vision magic at it and sprinkled some machine learning on top, I would be able to conquer Super Hexagon in no time. It turned out to be a bit more difficult than that. At first I tried using supervised learning, where a machine learning model would learn from me playing the game, but that didn't really go anywhere. Then I tried using reinforcement learning, where a model would try to learn the game all by itself, which did show some promise, but since I can't simulate the game, it would simply be too slow and would probably take months of non-stop playing to actually get anywhere. After a lot of banging my head against the wall, I ultimately had to give up and shelve the project with the intent to come back once I had a better programming skill set to attack the problem with. Recently, I felt motivated to give it another go and finally managed to make it work. In the end, I decided against using any machine learning, which means the solution I came up with uses a variety of computer vision techniques to extract features from screenshots of the game and a rule-based approach with simple heuristics to decide what moves to take. Let's start out by looking at a demo of the program in action and then I'll dive into how it works afterwards. And there you have it. Now let's get technical. There are three steps to making this all work, which boils down to the following. Number one, extract features from screenshots taken while the game runs. Number two, find patterns that the obstacles we want to avoid form. Number three, based on this information, decide whether to move left, right, or stay still. This is all done at every other frame in the game, so 30 times a second. Let's start by going through how we extract information about elements of the game from just screenshots. To do that, we use the powerful and ever useful Python package called OpenCV Python, which has a bunch of useful features for extracting information from images, among many other things. If you want to follow along with the code for the things I show, there is a link to the Git repository in the description and everything I explain will be annotated to show where in the code that thing happens. For each screenshot of the game, the first thing we do is mask out the text at the top of the screen, since it is irrelevant and will just get in the way. Then we apply thresholding, turning every pixel below a certain value black and every other pixel white. This lets us use an OpenCV feature that finds contours in the image, which are basically all the shapes that the white pixels make up. This way we can locate the pixels that make up all the different features we need, which include the hexagon in the middle, the cursor, and all the obstacles we want to avoid. Once we've identified the contours in the image, we want to find the hexagon at the center of the screen, since it forms the basis of how everything else is oriented. Unfortunately, we can't just assume that the contour that's closest to the center of the screen is the hexagon, since we run into these cases sometimes, where the obstacles coming in merge with the hexagon. Instead, we first use a feature from OpenCV called Flood Fill to fill out the pixels of the hexagon in the middle. Then we invert the this image, merge it with our original image using a binary or operation, and finally perform thresholding to isolate the hexagon. Next we use yet another OpenCV feature to approximate a polygon from this shape, which allows us to find the six corners of this hexagon. Then we can fit lines through opposite corners and can use those to split the screen into six sides, which I call sectors, where obstacles can appear. 
The next step is finding where the cursor is, so we know where on the screen we are and in turn can figure out where we need to go. Finding the cursor is simple enough, we just find the smallest contour that mostly resembles a triangle that is also within a specific distance from the center of the screen. Since we split the screen into six sectors earlier, we now know in which sector the cursor is. But we want a little more precision than that, we would also like to know exactly where the cursor is within the sector, which is what we calculate next. This is done by comparing the angle from the cursor to the two lines that make up the sector we're in and clamping this to a value between minus 1 and 1, where minus 1 means the cursor is close to the left edge of its sector and 1 means it's close to the right edge. In this case, the angle to this edge is slightly smaller, so we end up with a positive number. Now it's time to look at the obstacles that we need to avoid. Again, since we split the screen into sectors, we know in which sector all the obstacles are. The next step is figuring out how far away from the center of the screen they are, so we know how urgent it is to move out of the way. To find the distances, we go through each sector and look at the contour of every obstacle in that sector. Then we find the point on the contour that's closest to the middle of the screen and measure the distance between those points. We go through every sector and do this for every obstacle. Next we find the area that every obstacle makes up, since this will help us detect certain patterns in the obstacles, which we will need later on. The final thing we need to keep track of is connections between obstacles across sectors. Some obstacles like this one or this one form a shape where there is only one exit. This helps us immensely since we won't have to employ any fancy heuristics in these cases, we just have to move to the sector where the exit is. The way we figure out whether contours form larger connections is by going through each obstacle in each sector and seeing whether it is contained within a larger contour. If it is, we keep track of that, which lets us build a sort of connected component structure which we can later use to more easily navigate the obstacles. And that's essentially all the information we need to extract from screenshots of the game. Now that we know where each sector is on the screen, where the cursor is, how far away and how large the obstacles are, as well as connections of obstacles across sectors, we are almost armed with all the knowledge we need to actually play the game. There is just one more thing we need to do, and that is to find certain problematic patterns that the obstacles can form. Obstacles in Super Hexagon can form one of these six patterns. When each pattern will arrive as you play the game is random and some occur more often than others. There are two specific patterns that we need to detect and specifically handle. The rest we will talk about in a bit. These two patterns are a little tricky because they don't behave like the others, so instead of trying to adapt our general purpose self-playing heuristic to these, we simply detect them outright and hardcode what moves to make when they appear. Let's first look at this pattern, which I call the keyhole pattern. In order to detect this, we set up three simple criteria. First, we look for an obstacle with an area larger than 20,000 pixels, and we require that the distance to this obstacle should be less than 45 pixels. However, these two criteria will also match this claw pattern because of this large obstacle. To avoid that, we have a final criteria that requires that the opposite wall from the large obstacle should have an area of less than 8,000 pixels, which will filter out the claw pattern because of this large obstacle. It's worth mentioning that the pixel values are all based on running the game in windowed mode. When running in full screen, the values will be different. To summarize, we detect the keyhole pattern with these three simple criteria. We'll get to how we use this information in a minute, but first there is one more pattern we want to detect which has this spiral shape. This pattern is slightly more difficult to detect, but it's not too bad. First, we require that the distance to the closest obstacle should be less than 60 pixels, and that the distance to the next closest should be less than 155 pixels. Then, we look for one big obstacle, followed by one about half the size, which should be mirrored on the opposite side. Between these obstacles, there should be two openings like so. Finally, spirals come in two types, those curving to the left and those curving to the right. To detect this, we simply look at whether these two obstacles are one smaller block followed by one larger or the other way around, which tells us whether it's a right curving or left curving spiral respectively. To summarize again, the spiral is detected by applying these three simple criteria with the caveat that we also need to determine its direction. With all that out of the way, we are finally ready to bring it all together and get to the logic of how to determine what moves to make in order to beat the game. Let's have another look at the obstacle patterns from before. We can now detect these two patterns that are a bit more tricky than the others and can solve them quite easily. When we detect the keyhole pattern, we simply hardcode these sequences of moves which will get us through no problem. Similarly with the spiral, we either move right for 19 frames or left depending on the direction of the spiral. This takes care of what to do for two of the patterns, which brings us to these next two. 
These are very similar to each other and are handled in the same way. They both have only one exit and since we figured out how obstacles are connected across sectors earlier, we can use that information to find out where the exit is. From there, it's a simple matter of finding out where we should move the cursor to get to the exit the fastest. In this case, if our cursor was in this sector, we would not need to do anything. If the cursor was in one of these two sectors, we would move left and conversely, if it was in one of these two, we would move right. In this case, the cursor is opposite from where we need to go and we need to do a full 180. Which direction to go now depends on where the cursor is within this sector. If it's slightly more to the right, we go right and vice versa. In this case, we are slightly more to the right, so we end up going right. Cool, so that's two more patterns dealt with. That brings us to the general purpose heuristic we employ when dealing with all other patterns and when moving between patterns. This heuristic is based on a risk score that we give to each sector. The sector with the lowest risk score is where we'll end up moving to. This top part gives a higher score to sectors where obstacles are very close to the middle of the screen. The bottom part gives a higher score to sectors that are far away from the sector the cursor is in. Let's look at an example. As mentioned, this part of the equation punishes sectors where obstacles are too close. For sectors with no obstacles, we set the closest distance to 400, so this expression will equal zero, which makes these two sectors the ones we want to go to. When we factor in the second part of the score, this sector becomes the most optimal, since it is closest to where the cursor currently is. The scores for each sector end up looking like this, and we wind up choosing the lowest score of 55 and going right. However, this is not always good enough. I ran into these things happening where the bud would be a little too fond of face planting into a nearby wall. To dissuade this from happening, we add a penalty for trying to cut across sectors where obstacles are too close. To do that, we look at each of the three sectors that are on opposite sides of the hexagon from where the cursor is. For the sector on the exact opposite side, we first check whether the cursor is to the left or right of the middle of its sector. In this case, the cursor is slightly to the left, which means if we were to move to the opposite sector, we would have to cross these sectors on the way. Then we take the risk scores of these two sectors and add a fraction of them to the risk score of the opposite sector to dissuade the bot from crossing sectors that are risky themselves. We do the same for this sector, where this sector is the only one we would cross, so we add a fraction of its risk score. Finally, we do the exact same on the opposite side. The new risk scores look like this, which should more accurately reflect the risk associated with each sector. In this case, the sector we end up going to hasn't changed from before, but in some instances it will. And there you have it, that's basically all it takes to create a self-playing program that can beat the hardest level of Super Hexagon with no knowledge of the game's code and with no fancy machine learning or AI, depending on your definition of AI. Now since this program is tailored to only work with this one level of the game, it would probably not work with some of the easier levels, though I haven't actually tried. But I don't think it would be too difficult to also make this work with the five other levels of the game, I just haven't bothered. It's also worth mentioning that the program isn't perfect by any means, it still sometimes fails in certain situations. But that's often what happens when you work with heuristics and magic numbers, and while I could probably spend a lot more time tuning all the knobs, I'm pretty happy that it beats the game in most attempts. I sincerely hope you enjoyed and or learned something from this video. If you haven't played Super Hexagon, you totally should, it's a fantastic game. I might make a similar video to this one talking about another self-playing program I made for Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes, but we'll see. Okay, bye!